This wide, majestic river flowing peacefully in the warm glow of the setting sun is the Danube. An axis of communication for men, merchandise, and ideas. A source of life for the villages and countrysides it flows through. The Danube is all this and much more. For millennia, the river has been at the heart of the history of the old continent. With its length of around 2,900 kilometers, the Danube crosses all of Europe from west to east, from Germany where it finds its source to the Black Sea where it empties. How to relate the saga of the Danube? It's impossible. A roman fleuve wouldn't suffice. So to make matters easier, we're going to board a river cruiser. Leaving from Romania, we will travel upriver day after day. Carried along by the Danube's magic, we will cross unknown regions, discover cities with glorious pasts, and meet men that share their love of this king of European rivers, as Napoleon Bonaparte called it. The Amadeus, our cruise boat, has left Romania and is heading towards Bulgaria, our first port of call. These two former Soviet bloc countries, Romania and Bulgaria, are now fully integrated into the European Union. This new political stability is a marked contrast to the time when conflicts shook the Balkans and the region of the Danube for centuries. Properly speaking, there is no such thing as a Danubian cultural identity, in that symbolically from 1453, the fall of Constantinople onward, there was a double cultural border. On the one hand, there was the political border of the Ottoman Empire, which lasted five centuries, and which was superposed on, and more or less coincided with, a religious border that marked the boundary between the regions that had been evangelized by the Byzantine monks and those evangelized by the German Catholic monks. So it's this double influence, orthodox mixed with the later Ottoman influence, that makes up the cultural specificity of the Balkans. We're arriving in Orianovo. For lack of a better place, we moor along this old floating pontoon. our boat and head for Sofia, 300 kilometers across the Bulgarian countryside. Sofia, Bulgaria's capital, resembles European cities at the end of the 19th century, with its wide avenues and neoclassical government buildings. Sofia. 
Sofia's originality lies elsewhere, in its religious buildings, which reflect the dual influence of the Orthodox and Ottoman cultures. Constructed in the 6th century, Sveta Sofia Basilica, Saint Sofia, who gave her name to the city, reflects the long Byzantine domination of the city. When the town fell under Ottoman control, Saint Sofia was transformed into a mosque, thus escaping destruction. The Ottomans not only transformed, they also built. The Banya Bashi Mosque, constructed in 1576 under the famous architect Sinan, is one of the oldest in Europe. In 1878, the victory of the Russian army put an end to five centuries of Ottoman domination. Nevsi Cathedral, built at the beginning of the 20th century to celebrate the country's liberation, is reminiscent of the Byzantine style, as if to bring the city's Ottoman chapter to a close. <laughs> We Bulgarians are very proud of the religious tolerance that reigns among our country's different communities. In Sofia, it's obvious. If you just look around, you see synagogues, mosques, and Christian churches. Here, all religions live together in peace. You can feel the influence of Islam on the daily life of Christians, but Christianity also has a significant influence on Islam in the Balkans. For example, the Muslims here venerate the saints. They go to Mass. Some of them even want to go to confession. That's unimaginable in other Muslim communities around the world. Back to our voyage. Amadeus is heading for Belgrade, but before reaching the Serbian capital, we'll cross through a gorge flanked by steep slopes that the Danube has carved out between the Carpathian and the Balkan mountains. At the narrowest place of this valley, Romania and former Yugoslavia jointly built a hydroelectric dam at the end of the 1960s. It's the largest in Europe, the Iron Gate Dam. Its name is a reference to the huge iron chain that used to block river traffic here and mark the border between the Austro-Hungarian and the Ottoman empires. After a short wait, the Amadeus slowly enters the lock.
As it fills, the lock acts like an elevator, lifting the Amadeus up several meters so she can continue sailing upriver towards Belgrade. This dam has been able to regulate the course of the Danube. Before the dam was built, only extremely powerful vessels could navigate this stretch of the river with its very rough waters. Political tensions between Tito's Yugoslavia and Romania often disrupted navigation through the Iron Gate Dam. During the 1990s, conflicts within ex-Yugoslavia and the embargo on Serbia that followed brought all navigation on this part of the Danube to a standstill. During that time, it was impossible to undertake a long trip across Europe like we're doing now on board the Amadeus. As we make our way through the Iron Gate Dam, life on board the Amadeus continues at its leisurely pace. Thank you. Thank you. All through the night we've continued our slow trip up the Danube. In the early light of dawn, we're approaching Belgrade. Rivers have always played a vital role in the history of humanity. By supplying the waters necessary to life, they fascinate man and give birth to civilizations. Inhabited since Neolithic times, the banks of the Danube have been colonized by the Greeks, the Romans, the Celts, and even the Thracians. As a natural axis of communication between the East and the West, the Danube became the main trade route of Europe. Belgrade was founded by the Celts in the 3rd century BC. Their original encampment was here on the site of Kalimegdan Fort, which has guarded the city's entrance since the 14th century. The Amadeus is approaching the wharf situated in the center of Belgrade. A number of cruise boats are already moored to the wharf. No matter, the captain will just double park. Strolling through the streets of Belgrade, it's hard to believe that not very long ago, Serbia was at war with other ex-Yugoslavian countries. With a population of one million, the Serbian capital is proud of its dynamism and is looking to redefine its place in Europe.
conquered and then lost over and again by Serbian rulers in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was not until the year 1867, after 346 years of domination, that the Ottomans finally left Kalemegdan Fort and the city of Belgrade. A symbol of national independence, the fort and its surrounding park are now a favorite place to stroll and relax for the people of Belgrade. Following along in our leisurely discovery of the Danube River Valley, we leave Belgrade in the direction of Novi Sad, the second Serbian port of call on our trip. In 1687, after two centuries of Ottoman occupation, the Austrians took over Petrovaradin, a little town on the banks of the Danube. Descendants of the very ancient Byzantine occupation, the Serbian inhabitants of Petrovaradin were orthodox. The Serbs were driven out by the Austrians, and they founded a new town not far away on the banks of the Danube. It was originally called Ratzenstadt, the town of the Serbs, but after a few years it became known as the New Town, or Novi Sad. For the inhabitants of Novi Sad, as for many other towns on the banks of the Danube, the now calm course of the river makes an ideal spot for sport and relaxation. A lot of people spend time near the Danube. Today the weather is so-so, but when it's nice, there are lots of people. They come to fish and stroll with their families and kids. I've been coming here a long time. I like the Danube. It calms me, I relax, I enjoy being near the water. It's not catching a fish that's so important for me. It's just being near the water. You know, I like the smell of the water. When you're a kid and you come to catch your first fish, you really get into it. You wait if you have to. I'm not a kid anymore, I don't care about the fish. I come here for the love of the Danube. Oh yes, I love the Danube. A light summer rain breaks out just as we're about to leave. The captain has cast off. We're leaving Novi Sad, and we salute Petrovaradin Fort as we go past. Built on plans by Vauban, the famous French architect, it has been watching over the Danube since the 17th century. As 
The bridge here was completely destroyed during the last war in ex-Yugoslavia. All the pillars were underwater. Since you couldn't see what was left of the bridge anymore, it was completely underwater, navigation was forbidden for two years. It was very hard to get by here. The current was strong and the only way through was going over the sunken bridge. Following the course of the Danube, we veer northward, heading towards Hungary and Moash, our next port of call. It's been five days now that we left Romania on board the Amadeus. After crossing the plains of the Danube's delta, skirting the Balkan and the Carpathian Mountains, we are now heading for the vast Hungarian plains. In the 9th century, after a long migration which lasted several hundred years, the Magyars, a community of nomadic warriors from Asia, settled in the central plains of Europe. These plains are bordered by two rivers, the Danube to the west and the Tisza to the east. And in between lie the Pusta. Vast stretches of land that once were used as prime pasture land for horses and cattle. The Hungarian plains are part of the national heritage. Today they are protected, as is the lifestyle of the Sikos, the heirs of a riding tradition that goes back centuries. The Amadeus is arriving in Moash. Local legends speak of mythical characters called Bushos. The Bushos were to have come from Croatia, crossed the Danube to drive off the Turkish troops in 1687 during the Battle of Moash, thus putting an end to a century and a half of occupation in Hungary. The Bushos are very important in the collective spirit and are reborn every year in the form of masks during the festival of Moash. Hello, welcome, my friends.
Here we sculpt primitive masks, masks that reflect a primitive way of thinking. They are full of belief and strength, they evoke myths and legends. In a way, I'm trying to get to man's innermost nature. These masks are based on fear, an ancestral and human belief. For us, they don't incarnate a savage nature of man, but primitive man's belief in gods and spirits, whose protection he asks in order to survive in security and not die prematurely. For me, the most important thing is man. The mask has its origin not there, but here. If the person wearing the mask believes in it, he will be one with the mask. Water is life, and these masks convey life. It's very important to me that the river and water maintain an important place in these customs. We're leaving Moash. In the gentle light of the setting sun, we head for Budapest. Arrival in Budapest in the middle of the night will remain one of the most beautiful moments of this whole trip. The Danube is the soul of Budapest. We could feel it arriving in the middle of the night, and now in the morning, as we look from Buda, the upper town, down to Pest, the lower town, we understand why. These two towns developed independently for centuries, each on opposite banks of the Danube. The Fisherman's Bastion is the most visited monument in Buda. This Disneyland fortress was built in the beginning of the 20th century in homage to the Fisherman's Guild that was in charge of defending a section of the town's fortifications in the Middle Ages. Despite its turbulent history, St. Matthias's Church displays a surprising degree of harmony Built in the 13th century, transformed into a mosque by the Turks, it was then abandoned before being partly rebuilt at the end of the 19th century. Until the middle of the 19th century, to go from Buda to Pest, you had to cross the Danube by boat.
The Bridge of Chains, opened in 1848, radically changed the destiny of the two towns that became one in 1873, thus officially giving birth to Budapest. The Industrial Revolution was underway. Pest, the district of the new capital, developed quickly with the construction of businesses, theaters, and large government and religious buildings. Buda may be the area most visited by tourists, but for the Hungarians, Pest will always be the city's beating heart. The people of Budapest love water and spas, and this is not only due to the proximity of the Danube. Between the two world wars, for example, temporary baths were built on the Danube, and it seems that office workers would go running out of their offices at noon for a cooling dip. Baths are a part of their history and their way of life. In Budapest, the bath culture is very interesting. It dates back to the Turkish era. We think of Turks in the Middle Ages as barbarians, but in fact, they were a lot cleaner than the Hungarians or the Austrians. They left us some very beautiful baths in Budapest. At the beginning of the 20th century, the craze for spas resulted in the construction of new baths. The Gellert is probably the most famous and the most beautiful. A masterpiece of Art Nouveau, the Gellert is a veritable temple to the glory of water, where inventive decoration and mosaics blend with sculptures and allegorical figures. Drawing on thermal springs rich in calcium, magnesium, sulfur and chloride, the Gellert's baths are both a health and fitness center and a place to relax and enjoy. Since we left Romania, everything we've seen bears witness to the civilizing role of the Danube River. It's worth mentioning, however, that for thousands of years there were continuous conflicts between the peoples whose lands it crosses. Many people say that the Danube should serve as a link between all the countries it crosses. I don't think it has ever been a real link as far as Hungary's history is concerned. Kossuth Lajos, a prominent Hungarian statesman who died in exile in Turin, always spoke of the federation of the Danube. He said that the peoples living along the river should unite, but that was never more than a dream.
The sun is shining once more on the Danube. On board the Amadeus, life has gone back to cruise mode. Continuing our journey, we leave Hungary for Austria. Next stop, Vienna. <laughs> Vienna, capital of the Habsburgs. Until the collapse of their empire in 1918, the Habsburgs reigned over a large part of Central Europe. Since their empire included a number of countries crossed by the Danube, like Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia, and a part of Romania, they were called the Danubian Monarchy. Nearly a century after the end of the Habsburgs, Meyerling, Strauss, Sissi, and Franz Joseph continued to represent the splendor and insouciance of Vienna for most tourists. The city has magnificent churches, rich museums, and many palaces and chateaus. But if you haven't been to a Viennese cafe, you haven't seen Vienna. The Sperl is one of the oldest cafes in Vienna. Stefan Schweig came here to write, and Sigmund Freud was said to have given consultations here. My father bought this cafe the year I was born. I came here every Saturday after school to eat my veal cutlet. But I thought there must be a lot of other places in the world more interesting than here. So I decided to go off and study, first in New York, then in Boston. I worked in Washington and after a few years I came back to my father's cafe. I guess it's a kind of twist of fate, but I'm very happy, really very happy that I came back here. We'd like to linger a bit longer in the spell, but time is passing. Before going back to the boat, we make a little detour to admire the Schönbrunn Imperial Palace and Gardens. Once again, the Amadeus has cast off. Leaving Vienna, we continue crossing Austria, heading for Melk. We've gone nearly 2,000 kilometers since leaving Romania, and the Danube continues to enchant and surprise us. We're entering into the Wachau Valley. For a few kilometers, 
we sail through the middle of a pastoral landscape where green mountainsides are dotted with little villages, vine-covered hills, and romantic ruins. After a few hours cruising, Melk Abbey appears on the horizon. Built on a granite promontory, the abbey dominating the village has been inhabited by Benedictine monks continually since the 11th century. But it played its most important role in the 18th century. Melk is one of the abbeys with an uninterrupted tradition. This means that the monks were never exiled or eliminated, that they have always lived here in this abbey. Saint Benedict wanted the monks to know how to read and write. This comes from the rule of Saint Benedict, where we find three very important precepts. In Latin we say, Ora et labora et lege, or pray and work and read, meaning Leaving Melk for Linz, our last port of call, we embark on the last leg of our journey. Day after day, stop after stop, we have discovered through the Danube a Europe that is rich and diverse.
balancing between the attachment to its cultural and religious roots and the determination to face the challenges of the modern world. Flowing along its peaceful course through the hustle and bustle of humanity, the Danube continues, as it has done since the beginning of time, to flow from west to east, from its source to its delta. Sofia, Belgrade, Budapest, Vienna, all these cities are daughters of the Danube. Born on the banks of the river, they have honored it with palaces, churches, and sumptuous chateaus. The stopovers we made on the Danube were all like so many stopovers in an amazing journey through time. Linz will be our last discovery. Even though it doesn't enjoy the same prestige as the major capitals of the Danube, Linz does have a castle, some beautiful churches, and a charming town center. Here, as in all the towns we visited, tradition plays a very important role. Tradition such as the secret of making linzer torta, a cake that has been part of the town's reputation for generations. This peaceful little town on the banks of the Danube could have had another destiny. Adolf Hitler lived in Linz from the age of 10 to the age of 18. His fascist utopian dream was to make it the cultural capital of his empire. The fall of the Third Reich fortunately turned the wheel of fate. The irony of history is that Linz did find its cultural place through modern art. The town was designated European capital of culture in 2009. Our journey is over. We are leaving Linz beneath the lights of the Lentos Museum of Modern Art. Its reflection on the surface of the Danube's waters would almost confirm Johann Strauss's choice when, a century earlier, he named his most famous waltz the Blue Danube.